Hey everyone, welcome to The Cabin. My name is Alec Britz and today we're checking out the Elysia Audio Sculptor 500 series unit. Full disclosure, Elysia have sent over these units for me to review, but that will not affect this review in any way, shape or form. Starting at the front of the unit, it all begins with our gain part. The gain part is also a push part that allows you to see two different kinds of metering. On the first setting, you can see how much gain is being added to the device. And on the second setting, you can see more of a VU style of metering. Underneath that, we have the shape functionality. The more you wind in, you are adding harmonic content. On shape function number one, you're kind of beefing up the low mids, and on shape two, you're adding some of the upper harmonics to kind of open up things, but like vocals or acoustic guitars. Underneath that, we have the low cut. The low cut is continuously variable from 10 hertz all the way up to 375 hertz. Underneath that, we have our compression circuit. As a general rule of thumb, I don't really like one knob compressors, but for some reason, and I think it's got something to do with the way that Elysia has got the variable attack times here, so the more transient material there is, the faster the compression goes, and the more kind of legato and flowy something is, then the easier it is on the attack times. Elysia have elected to do the old one LED to show how much gain reduction is happening trick here. And to me, this is a bit of an oversight, but thankfully there is a way that they can improve it. So stick around to the end of the video to check that out. I love the way that Elysia have illuminated their name with an LED with a white background behind it. I think it looks really classy and really beautiful. Our first button is, of course, the shape 2 function, which, as I said earlier, kind of opens up that vocal range a little bit more. Then underneath that, we have our 48 volt phantom power. What I love about this is that you have to press and hold it for it to turn on. And as soon as you do that, the whole channel strip mutes, which then stops any clangs and bangs, which is very appreciated. And then after a while, it stops flashing, and then you know that everything is charged up and ready to go and the channel unmutes. Once again, when you want to turn it off, you have to press and hold it, which is a very intentional thing. Then we have our mute button. Now the mute button is a really lovely thing to be able to have on a channel strip. However, I think Elysia have kind of over-designed themselves here because as soon as you plug in a jack to the DI input, which we'll get to in a second, the channel mutes immediately. And as soon as you turn on phantom power, the channel strip mutes immediately. So I love the fact that there is a mute button here, but it also doesn't really get used as much as I thought it would because it automatically engages. Finally, on the front over here, we have our DI input, which is a balanced one mega ohm input. It's wide open. I love the way it sounds with the passive bass guitar. Active bass guitar sounds really beautiful in front of it as well. The next thing I wanna talk about is the cube form factor that this can be shipped in. Now, the cube is not compatible with other 500 series modules. I don't know if that's because there's too much voltage, but for Elysia, this is designed for their units. And what this allows them to do is to be able to guarantee exactly the performance figures that they are aiming to get. Because there are so many different kinds of racks, it's difficult to know exactly how the unit will perform. So Elise just kind of circumvented this problem by making their own 500 series racks just for their stereo units that ensures optimal performance irrespective of wherever you are in the world. One massive upshot for me with this is the fact that this thing fits into my backpack and looks fantastic in my home studio, which I can't wait to show you, by the way. On the rear of the device, we have XLRs in and out. I wish that on the inputs, they were locking. We then have TRS in and out for ease of use. And then, of course, we have our power input over here, as well as the switch on the back. Generally, I like to have the power switches for things in the front, but because of the form factor here, I have no problem just reaching around the back and turning it on or off. Power is universal with a switching power supply, so wherever you are in the world, this thing's gonna work just fine.
That's the Sculptor 500. I've had these, I think, for about six weeks. I've enjoyed the noise performance and the character of the Mic Pre. Although it is not inherently massive sounding or super colorful, you can add in harmonics to kind of tailor it to the tastes that you want. The compression, like I said before, is really easy and nice to use. The low cut feels musical and smooth. I like that it's there just on one potentiometer, easy to go for while I'm in the middle of vocal takes or something. Just works like a charm. Love the sound of the DI on bass. It feels great. Electric guitar is really smooth and really easy. And it seems like it can take quite a heavy load. So for those of you who are playing active electric basses or want to plug in your synthesizer, this thing is going to be just fine. But it's not to say that there aren't things that could be improved. One of the downsides to this device is the fact that there is no output fader. So I think that there's two ways that Elisa can solve for this problem. The first is to put the compressor before the preamplification signal. That way it is working with a really low voltage. The Manly Vox box does this a little bit and it stops them having to add in two separate gain stages which adds noise. That would of course then save space so they wouldn't have to add in another potentiometer on this device for an output. The other thing that would be lovely to be able to have on this device is a better way to see the gain reduction. I like the fact that I can see how much gain I'm putting into a mic pre, but that doesn't really help me as much as being able to see the VU of the microphone preamplifier. So I would have preferred to just have the VU setting and on that secondary function press in the gain, that can then show gain reduction. So it's a much easier way of seeing between the two. The other thing that I think would be very useful to me because I'm quite hard of sight is that beautiful white Elysia logo, if there was a way to make that go all the way down the side of the buttons, that can highlight the text so that in a darker room like this, it's very easy to see what's going on. I like the fact that everything's tactile. I like the feeling of the indented switches, which is very useful again for recall if you do use this for mixing. So all in all, it feels like it's built <laughs> like it's ready to be put into a rocket and fired off into space and to come back and still turn on like it's just any other Tuesday. So one of the first questions comes from Dev Cho 3685, enough gain for hungry mics. I would definitely say that there's enough gain for hungry mics. Recording felt piano is generally something that requires a lot of gain and I use the Josephson E22s which have a bit of self noise in them and I got really usable results without having to use these too aggressively. LB35140 has said shootout versus a popular 500 series mic pre for reference. Sure, I could do that in a separate video, perhaps against the Cranbourne audios. So the next question comes from 68 snaps. How does shape one and two compare with R&D silk red and blue. What I would say is that the Rupert Neve design silk circuits are really subtle, right? They don't go into flat out distortion or straight out fuzz. Whereas with the Sculptor 500, you very quickly can get into that beautiful range of thick, heavy distortion or a bit more fuzzy tones if you'd like to. So in that way, they do differ quite a lot. Although they do, as you highlighted in the secondary comment, focus on similar parts, the subtlety of them is quite different. And of course, the type of saturation is a little bit different as well. How does it sound when clipping? Of course, without clipping the AD converters. It doesn't sound fantastic when driving it too hard because there's nothing to kind of bend the tone. You don't have any transformers or any valves to kind of soak up some of that transient information. Because you have the option of using the shape, you can pick how fat or driven you want it to be. And finally from Nkosi, absolute legend. How do you feel these compared to something like the Camdens as an entry into the 500 series pre's? Equivalent audio examples would rule too. It definitely seems like there needs to be a shootout between these two devices. These things are punching toe to toe with all of your big brand stuff. In fact, with Elysia, I think one of the things that is confusing to me is that they sound so good, they could easily charge twice as much and none of us would bat an eyelid. But the fact that it is more affordable seems to lump it in with some products that don't necessarily perform half as well or give you half as much versatility and specifically do not come anywhere close to the build quality that Elysia consistently offers on everything they make. So 
That is the Elysia Sculptor 500 series unit. If you have enjoyed what you've watched here, please consider subscribing. If you really enjoyed what you watched, consider dropping a super thanks. That allows me to be able to upload more consistently. Most importantly, I hope that you're all looking after yourselves and you're being kind. I'll see you in the next video.